much for any further ado, it's really my, my honor to, uh, to introduce Jacob Sabaroff, who is a correspondent with NBC News and MSNBC. Um, for his reporting on the administration's child separation policy, he received the 2019 Walter Cronkite Award for Individual Achievement by a national journalist um, and the 2019 Hillman Prize for Broadcast Journalism. Uh, he's appeared on uh, Today, on Morning Joe, The Rachel Maddow Show, Late Night with Seth Meyers, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and, and numerous other um, programs. And, and really, it's an honor to be able to have him with us today. Um, if you have not already uh, read his book and don't own it yet, um, there's actually a button within your schedule right below where you clicked to uh, join the session um, that says uh, purchase the author's book. Um, so you can get that today. Um, but uh, we'll be able to hear from uh, Jacob for, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so all about um, his work and his reporting um, and his book Separated. I, I do need to say before we start um, that while much of the content of this session is political in nature, um, very political in nature, We Move North America is a nonpartisan organization. Um, so we do not and we cannot um, endorse candidates. So and any partisan conclusions that um, are made in this session only that reflect the uh, opinions of individual speakers and not lead with North America. Our mission is to provide a space for the flourishing of ideas um, and to bring people together to discuss them. And in that vein, we are just um, delighted, uh, Jacob, to have you here with us today. So thank you, Jacob. And everyone, he is interrupting vacation with his family. No, it's day. fine. It's fine. It's actually nice to be here hiding in the bedroom. I'm not hanging out with my kids right now. Um, thank you, David. And hi, everybody. How's it going? So, Jacob, we got the thumbs up. Got lots of waves, waves and thumbs up. Um, Jacob, why don't we just start, uh, for those who haven't had a chance to hear you on just about every um, news channel and uh, you know talk show and everything for the last few weeks talking about your work, will you just give us a, a short overview of, of really how you came to um, be so heavily involved in reporting on this issue, what you found, and, and, and really the, the, the key takeaways that um, you think we should be knowing? Yeah, sure. Well, a couple things. One is, and I, I actually am glad, David, that you brought up um, that this is a nonpartisan talk, because I, I really do see this. And when I say this, I mean what I witnessed as a reporter um, covering President Trump's separation of thousands of children from their parents down at the border. I, I really do see it as a nonpartisan issue. And the thing that I just want to say right off the bat is, and then I'll get into how I got to this and stuff. Um, what I witnessed, which was um, seeing separated children um, at the epicenter of the policy uh, in South Texas, both in the Rio Grande Valley, um, in Brownsville, but also in McAllen, um, with my own eyes. Uh, and what today we know was the systematic torture in the words of Physicians for Human Rights, a nonpartisan Nobel Peace Prize winning organization and the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's all obviously a nonpartisan um, organization made up of medical professionals, which called this government sanctioned child abuse what the Trump administration was able to do would not have been possible were it not for 30 years of failed um, border immigration policy by both Democrats and Republicans. I, I really do think that while the Trump administration took this to a place that no other administration had ever before, um, they were able to do so because um, of deterrence-based uh, immigration policy that we can credit to Bill Clinton, um, George W. Bush, and yes, even Barack Obama. And while none of them ever, and I'm sure that the internet will light up as soon as I say this, while, while there was never family separation on a large scale under President Obama, and that's just a fact, what President Trump was able to do was enabled by all these administrations that came before it. So um, I'm happy this is a nonpartisan conversation because I do see this as a nonpartisan, a really nonpartisan topic. Um, and then secondly, how did I get to this? Just really simply, I grew up in LA. I grew up in a city that is today um, and I don't even like the term majority minority because the so-called minority is the majority um, at this point, a city that has more people of color uh, than people that look like me. And it's, it, that's an undeniable reality that I grew up with even um, decades ago. And so when I became a journalist, it was a no brainer to start looking into issues that affected the people who were my neighbors and friends um, and colleagues. Um, Specifically, when President Trump you know, ran for office, he talked about right off the bat, Mexicans being rapists and criminals. And so I think anybody who was covering this administration had a responsibility to look into what he was saying and whether or not it was based in reality. Did we need a wall? Did we not need a wall? Were drugs pouring over like he said he was, or were they not? Was MS-13 really spilling across the border? And all these were things that I had focused on as a journalist as the 
family separation policy was being developed. And what I write about in the book, and I really want to be clear about, is that I, there were many other journalists and activists um, and people on the front lines that saw this coming well before I did. And even though I fancied myself as a reporter who understood immigration and these topics, um, I myself uh, missed the family separation policy, even though oftentimes it was right in front of my face. And so that's how I got into it. Um, that's how I ended up in the middle of it. Um, but I don't deserve any credit at all. I just happened to be at the, at the had the misfortune of seeing this policy with my own eyes because I was in the right place at the wrong time. So talk us through how you ended up in that right place, or wrong place at the right time. Um, what was that like and how did this become um, such an important uh, journalistic issue for you to, to take on and report about? Well, I was working on a Dateline, an hour long special about the realities of life along the border uh, for Dateline NBC. And it was gonna be a lot of these issues that I had thought covering the border was all about. What's the reality of life in El Paso versus Juarez or San Diego versus Tijuana or McAllen um, versus Reynoso or Brownsville versus Metamoros? Um, are the drugs coming in? Um, do ranchers or other people who live in the borderlands really want the wall or don't they want the wall? And as I was working on this story for Dateline and spending months and months covering these issues, the family separation policy started to develop um, and become executed. And it was covered by people like my colleague Julia Ainsley or Caitlin Dickerson from the New York Times or Lomi Creel now at ProPublica. And as I was missing all of these stories, I was also simultaneously developing a relationship with the people who were implementing them. The border patrol agents who took me out into the desert uh, in the middle of the night to chase migrants so they could show me what their side of the story is like. And only um, after I was invited to go tour these facilities by a woman named Katie Waldman, whose name is now Katie Miller, the wife of Stephen Miller, um, to see for my own eyes, for myself with my own eyes, what this policy was like, um, I, I had no idea. And my colleague Chris Hayes was talking about it, other journalists were talking about it. But she said to me, and she said it frankly, she wanted me to go in with other journalists to be able to characterize what was happening inside these facilities before they allowed Democrats in because they wanted to get their take out there. Here's what it really looked like on the inside and here's why, so they said, they were doing the policy. And once I walked in and first I saw Brownsville, um, the 1,500 boys living in this shelter for 22 hours a day, allowed outside two hours a day only. Uh, and then I went to McAllen where I saw kids in cages, sleeping on floors under mylar blankets, supervised by, by security contractors in a watchtower. I sort of said, and I walked out right to the cameras and I said exactly what I believed and I never turned back from saying exactly what I felt about what I saw. And credit to my bosses because they never said to me, hey, slow down. You know, maybe you ought to think of a different way to describe what you're saying as cages. They just said, go out there and say what you saw and continue to document this until there are answers, because that was the point, that there weren't answers. They wanted me to go show it, the government did, for their own reasons. And once I went in, I said, I don't really care what they're saying to me. I'm going to tell our viewers um, what I saw. And, that, and that's exactly what I did. Do you think that they expected you to report on what was happening and see something different than what you saw? I think what they thought is that through me describing and others describing the horror of what we saw inside, they would be able to force the government to change the rules so that they could do what they're doing now, honestly. And they just used COVID to ultimately accomplish what they thought family separations would, which is indefinitely detain families, not let them out, uh, and deport immediately young children who come to this country by themselves. And there are laws, uh, Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, the Flores Settlement Agreement that are designed to protect children in this circumstance. And right now they're just flouting them. But what they thought at the time was family separations once made public would be so horrible, so horrific, so hard for the American people and the Congress to, to digest that, that Congress would change the laws to allow them to do what they really wanted to do, which by the way, were the same underlying goals with the Obama administration as well. They just never used the systematic torture of thousands of children in order to accomplish those goals. So, um, so that's what I, th I don't think, that's what I know. That's what they wanted to accomplish in all of this, to scare both the families from coming uh, and to scare the Congress into, into acting. 
Um, and they were able to accomplish neither of those things. People still continue to come despite the fact nobody's allowed into the country because of COVID. And uh, they're kicking people out, saying that they're doing so under the guise of public health when the people that they're deporting are tested for COVID before they're deported anyways. And, and many of them, most of them don't have it. And there's reporting on that too. So um, that's what it was about. That's why they let me in. And it's not a theory. It's, a, it's just, that's the facts. There's a really, uh, I felt interesting point in your writing where you talk about, I, I wrote down the date, when was it? It was June 17th, 2018. Um, Father's Day. Oh, was it? Yeah. So, and, and you were a new father. Um, and someone I think wrote about this also, but in, in the chat box, but you were watching tweets um, from President Trump and, and you write about questioning in your head, could you start being um, as direct as you wanted to be in your responses? Um, because perhaps you were leaving the realm almost of journalist and, and, and becoming advocate. And, and I wonder if you can talk for a second as a journalist about sure what it has meant to you, meant to, you to, to essentially straddle, the, straddle these two roles on this issue. Um, you are, on the one hand, reporting um, so deeply and intimately about such an important issue. And on the other hand, it's, it's very clearly become very important and personal um, to you through your reporting. Yeah, I think it became personal to a lot of people. I mean, most people that watch this, watch me cover it and watch other people cover it. And I don't see the work that I'm doing as, as adv advocacy in any way, actually. What I see is my job is to report the facts on the ground, which is a whole military and diplomatic term. And I was an advanced guy before I was in um, journalism. I was Mike Bloomberg's advanced guy in college. And then I worked for Howard Dean when he was running for president. And I never went to journalism school. The only job I ever really had was in politics before I became a journalist. And what I learned there was to soak up every bit of information I could and relay it back in the most honest way that I knew how to the principal, to the boss, so that that person could make decisions with the information that I was able to gather. And that's the way that I see my job as a journalist. I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna tell you what I saw. I'm not gonna hide the way that it made me feel seeing what I saw. I'm not gonna editorialize about what I saw either. I'm just gonna to report to you um, the, the facts on the ground. And that's what I did that night both on the 17th of June, but, but a couple of days before that, on the 13th of June, after I went into Casa Padre, that former Walmart, and I came out and maybe people who are listening to us right now who are here in the Zoom remember that night, but I talked with Chris Hayes for like eight minutes straight that night after I came out of the Walmart and I, and I basically answered every question that he had as if he was Mayor Bloomberg or Howard Dean taught, you know, wanting to know about what's he going to see if he went in there. How many staff are there in there? What do the kids say? Are we allowed to talk to them? Um, and, and then really like, how did it make me feel? And I don't, I've never believed, but this really reinforced it for me that anybody approaches anything purely objectively. I don't think that that actually exists. I don't believe in some kind of unbridled, totally neutral, objective look on anything. Every one of us that's here has a vantage point through which we understand the world and see things through our own eyes. And mine was as me who was a father of young kids, but also a white privileged person from Los Angeles. I mean, you can't just erase that or put it to the side as a reporter. And so I just try to be as honest as I could with our audience when I would relay these things and say, you know, I remember saying to Chris, I'm the father of a young child. I, I have two kids now, but I'm the father, I was a father of a young child then. And I remember saying that to Hayes and he said back to me, yeah, I'm the father of, I think he had two kids at the time, has three now. And I just try to be open and honest about that. And then the more honest I am about the, the vantage point through which I'm seeing something, then our audience can decide. If I'm standing there like Ron Burgundy saying, you know, I, I'm Mr. Neutral, polished news anchor, and there are certain metal things that are also used cages, and maybe they could also be a baseball backstop. It's like, well, I'm not serving anybody. And I'm, and I'm also, putting a governor on the way that I really saw this. And so I just feel grateful to be able to be at a place where I can speak to you guys about sort of my methodology, but also go on television and, and say what I really believe. And then if, trust me, if I cross the line, they call me. And I, there have been times where they call me and say, hey, you know, chill or hold your horses or why don't you think about saying that in a different way? But this was not one of them. And this story to this day has not been one of them. And 
my book went through NBC standards, you know, coming on to talk to you guys goes through that same process that I use when I'm reporting. And I've been empowered to, to basically tell the truth about this, which is what I really see this as. So update us, if, if you will, then for just on, on the truth of where this story, where this issue is today, right? Mm -hmm. Where are we in August 2020? Yeah. Well, the total number of children separated by the administration is over 5,400, if not 5,500 um, children. About 2,800 of them were taken away systematically during this period of zero tolerance when I was down on the border. And I'm talking about over the course of a couple of weeks, months, maybe at the most, a month and a half. Before then, though, it was discovered, subsequent to the policy being ended, that the administration separated over a thousand kids before from their parents and a thousand from their parents since. Um, and right now, the government is still working on tracking down uh, every child and parent. And that is because, as I've reported, you know, they, the way in which they documented, or I guess the lack of documentation about what they did to these children, resulted in a situation where the systems that recorded where the parents were and the systems that recorded where the children were did, never spoke to each other. And they went forward with these separations knowing this. It's in my book. The people who spoke out about it are in my book. They speak about it on the record. People have spoken out about it subsequently. I've spoken about it in my reporting. And so what you have now is 5,400 kids plus, where a thousand of them in particular who were separated before zero tolerance, there's this ongoing on the ground search to confirm who they are and where they are with NGOs in Central America, in places like Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador. And because of COVID, these searches have basically stopped. And so, I, in fact, yesterday, I think it was, or two days ago, I tweeted out a flyer from the organizations that are now looking for these children and parents to reach out to them so that we, there can be some type of record keeping about where they are and who they are so that they can receive not only mental health counseling from the United States government, which they're now legally entitled to, um, but also at some point, whatever else the government needs to do in order to make this right. Because it, it has been found that what the government did was violate their constitutional rights, which I should say as an aside, they were warned they would do before they ended up signing this policy, Kirsten Nielsen specifically. There's so many questions I wanna ask and so little order of time to be able to do it. You, you, just, you just brought up Kristen Nielsen, for, and, and I was struck in your writing um, about the moment of her, uh, her, her Senate confirmation hearing. Yes. Um, and specifically the, the, the questions that Kamala Harris wrote to her. Um, Isn't that amazing, by the way, that, you know, the woman who became the vice presidential nominee was the one who wrote the most pointed questions about families. I, I'm interrupting your question. Go ahead. But she basically lied to Kamala Harris. She said she was going to answer all these questions about family separation if they, it ever became in development or ever came in front of her. And the, 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 it's, that's all in the book, too. It's like every one of the questions that Neil, uh, Harris asked Nielsen was so prescient about what ultimately happened, yet Nielsen just blew them off. You answered my question without me being able to ask it. So it's great. No, I mean, but you, you now, I, I mean, I wonder just if I can extrapolate a little further, you now have the, the possibility of a future vice president um, in a position where potentially she was lied to, um, as your reporting suggests. Um, where do, do you see that going somewhere? Do you see this? Do you see, does Kristen Nielsen continue to, 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 to come up in this story moving forward or is she um, just left to a prior chapter, if I can put it in those terms? Um, it's a good question. And I think what I'm trying to do, even subsequent to the book coming out, because it's been so interesting that so many people have come forward to me since the book's come out saying, there are other things that you should know. The, my belief, while I'm not here to present all the evidence, my belief is that they knew what they were doing and certain people knew exactly what they were doing. And ultimately there will be some accountability for this. Um, but I don't have the answer, like a good advanced man should say, I don't have the answer to your question right now. Um, but I do think in time, the more we know and the more we're able to learn about, about all of this, in particular about who was warned and what the intentionality of all this was, um, that's when you'll see consequences if there will be them. And, and I do think that, um, 
I don't buy any of this stuff. I'm sure you've seen Miles Taylor come out on television from the Department of Homeland Security talking about how he was so opposed to all this stuff at the time. I think a lot of this is a big performance right now by people who were intimately involved in what happened. I don't think, I know. And um, one day all this stuff will become untangled. Right now, it's shrouded in politics and it's shrouded in anti-Trump. But there's a lot more layers to this than just Donald Trump did something very, very bad. Um, and, and that's when we'll, that's when I think you'll see some level of accountability. So let, let's, let's talk a little bit more about, about this issue of accountability. And, and, you know, one of the things that's so clear in your writing is that, um, it, no one is willing to come out as this is all developing and, and, and be straightforward or honest. And, and there seems to be, a, it's very shifty, um, in, in who's acknowledging what's happening or when it's happening or why it's happening. And, and, and th does that leave us um, in a place moving forward where there is the capacity for accountability? I mean, is, is, the, is the evidence trail there? Is the documentation there? Is, is that, is it, what, where does that go? I do think it's there. And I think it just continues to pull, you know, continuing to pull out the threads. I wrote the book in a year, right? Like, and I wrote it, started in July, 2019, after, you know, that was a year out from reporting on it in real time. And in that year, I learned so much more than I knew in real time. And I learned about Commander Jonathan White, who was one of the real heroes um, fighting behind the scenes, pushing back against the Department of Homeland Security. He was the guy who had the custodial, I'm sorry, he was the guy who had the, he was the director at one point of the Office of Refugee Resettlement um, running the, the refugee system. And he got into it pretty badly with Scott Lloyd, who became the Trump political appointee who oversaw ORR. And Jonathan White had the best interest of the children at heart. They had a lot of back and forth about what to do in the case of separations happening. And Scott Lloyd, ultimately, long story short, when the list of 700 separated children leaked in April of 2018 to the New York Times, you might've heard Rachel Maddow talk about this when I was on with her, because she in particular, I think rightly so, thought that this was a pivotal moment. The, in, the instinct of Scott Lloyd was to get rid of the list. Um, and his subordinates understood that to be a, an instruction to destroy the list, which would have been um, catastrophic, getting rid of a critical linkage between the parents and children that would be used in the reunifications of these families. And so there are things like that, the evidence um, from emails from people like Commander White or from Scott Lloyd's subordinates saying, I was instructed to get rid of this important list. All of that stuff one day, I think, will, I mean, I really truly believe that this family separations will be remembered with some of the most horrendous moments in American history. The original sin of slavery, Native American genocide, um, Japanese internment, the turning around of the St. Louis. I mean, there are a lot of moments in American history where you'll look back and you'll say, uh, this, was, this was the next in a long line of indignities and injustices brought against um, people who were seen as other in this, in this country. And there's plenty of evidence to get back to your question to support that. Thank you. There, there's a question just from Joni that I, I think we all want to know. Where is Stephen Miller in all of this? Right. Obviously well, now he, sure. he's, ma he's married to, 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 to Katie also, but, but um, obviously expecting a baby. Mazel tov to them. Honestly, and I really do hope the best for them. Seriously. Like, I liked Katie Miller and I liked working with her and I, I only saw Stephen Miller face to face once and I actually write about that in the book in a ballroom in Colorado where really he previewed all of these heinous ideas that they ultimately ended up um, implementing upon immigrants. We just reported, Julia Ainsley and I last week, that Stephen Miller held a show of hands vote in the White House Situation Room um, ahead of Kirsten Nielsen moving forward with the policy. And he said, it's un-American if we don't move forward with this and asked for the assembled um, senior administration officials, including cabinet members like Mike Pompeo, Alex Azar, John Bolton, um, people like Mark Short, who's now the chief of staff to the vice president, John Kelly was in the room, Don McGahn, who was the White House counsel, to literally raise your hand if you're willing to, and Nielsen was there, move forward with separations. And the only one that didn't raise her hand was Nielsen. So to me, I mean, that's Miller pushing this, but that's a sign that this guy has got 
the most senior cabinet level officials in check or in line with him and what he wants to do. And the way that he's badgering over and over and over again is the way that it was described to me. That this man has control of this interagency process in a way that really is, number one, it's not designed to work that way, but number two is pretty unprecedented. Um, I'm not a historian, but just in terms of who I've talked to about the way these immigration policy decisions were made. Uh, so I think his hands are all over it. And by the way, I say that not to exonerate Nielsen. She ultimately signed the memo herself. But there were concerns and reservations. None of them, by the way, were on moral grounds. They were all on logistical grounds. We might have overflow of kids. There might be too many um, kids for the amount of beds that we have. Um, but it was Miller who was pushing. And, the, and again, back to the evidence, that's all there. You know, I mean, you can read about it in his emails. You can talk to anybody who was involved in the policy. Stephen Miller was there every step of the way, every twist and turn. And tr Donald Trump, even after he ended the policy, wanted to bring it back. I write about it in the book, they were on a trip to go see tornado damage in Alabama. 20 people were dead, 20 plus people were dead. And on Marine One, he leans over to Kirsten Nielsen and, and the thing he's thinking of, because people like Stephen Miller are whispering in his ear is not, what can we do for these victims? But, hey, Kirsten, we have to reinstitute that. And she says, what? You know, and they're talking about the family separation policy. And Nielsen says, I'm not sure I can do that on my own. And Melania Trump, who happened to be sitting there, well, you know, as far as this is concerned, I'm no fan of either. Just read what she said, you know, in this new Melania Trump book about family separations, shows a lack of understanding. But anyway, she leaned over and said to him, no, no, we can't, we can't. And Trump says, we'll see, we'll see. Miller's still pushing for stuff like this. Um, he was pushing for it back then, he's still pushing for it now. You just mentioned that uh, no one really brings up the moral issue within the administration or certainly within, you know, the agencies that are, that are enacting these policies. And you've touched on this, but will you talk to us for a second about the, the moral issue? What, what is this morally for you? It's, um, it's, it's been interesting because it's now, there are now groups who have the medical expertise, as I mentioned earlier, to call what I saw what it was, which I didn't have the intellectual ability to sort of articulate at the time. It was torture, according to Physicians for Human Rights. Um, again, who won a Nobel Peace Prize for their work on landmines. It was, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, who Trump is citing now about getting children back to school, which I find incredibly rich because they were the most vocal critics at the time of the policy, government-sanctioned child abuse. And so when it comes to morality, I don't know how anyone who has any modicum of a moral compass can support this. And it's why, in the book, I choose to focus on the father and son, Juan and Jose, who not only did I get to know, but who Juan, the father, had crossed multiple times before illegally. And I remember this like it was any other day. Yesterday, he laughed when he said, I said, why? You know, why did you keep coming back? He said, because they didn't catch me. And he was coming to work and going home to Guatemala. But when he ultimately came as a refugee fleeing narco violence with his son, they were separated. And the morality part of it for me is what I, what I came to sort of learn and understand and believe truly is that it doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from or how many times you've tried to cross into this country. I remember what my colleague, the Reverend Al Sharpton said at the eulogy for George Floyd, he cited, um, and I know that this is a group of like me, a Jewish audience, but he cited the Bible in saying, there, there is a passage talking about the rejected stone becoming the cornerstone um, in the Bible. And George Floyd, to Reverend Sharpton, was that rejected stone, a man who might not have been perfect, who became a great example for all of us to talk about the great racial injustice in this country. And I see Juan as a very similar example. He might not have been the perfect example of an immigrant coming who went to Harvard and did this and that and became a successful such and such. But there's, but to me, I don't care what they did. They were tortured by definition by the United States government. And that's where morality comes into this. It doesn't matter what crime was that he committed. Does it make it okay that our government, he was tortured at the hands of our government the minute he stepped onto our soil, a place to him that represented safety and security and most importantly, refuge? The answer to me is obviously no. And I hope that, you know, when it comes to morality, that's how, that's the lens through which people understand what family separations were. Not about, did a parent come with a per kid who they said wasn't really their own or, did, you know, 
the list goes on and on. Did they know somebody who was in MS-13, whatever? I don't care about any, I mean, I care about all those things insofar as they're important to know about and understand, but what we're talking about and adjudicating is not that. It's the torture of human beings by the US government. How does your Jewish identity impact how you feel about all this and how you approach your work? Well, I, I mean, I was raised um, Jewish. I'm not, I'm not observant, honestly. I'm married to a Lebanese Italian Catholic woman. Um, our child gets to have the best of all of it. Um, I was brought up in a reconstructionist, very liberal environment, synagogue. But I believe that I have what I identify as a Jewish upbringing, right? Like Jewish culture, Jew, raised with grandparents who were speaking Yiddish. Um, it's just my part of my identity. And so I think that who I am and where I come from and the morals that I have, I very closely associated with my two Jewish parents from the Midwest and my grandparents and great grandparents from Russia and Poland. Um, I'm not a religious person today, but my identity is very much, um, and this is funny, you know, being married to a Lebanese Catholic woman, like this is something that she struggled, I think, initially to understand too. Like you're Jewish, but you're not really Jewish. What does that mean? And to me, I don't even sure that I can articulate what it means. But it, it is, it, it, it's who I am and how I sort of see, it's part of how I see the world as much as part of my identity as anything else. We're gonna have a, a little bit of time for, for everyone to ask um, any questions. So if you have questions, please do type them into the chat window um, or press the raise hand function and um, we'll unmute you so you can ask Jacob directly. Um, Jacob, one last question before we open it up. I, we're in the midst of what has to be the craziest, busiest, most unending, ongoing news cycle yeah. uh, in human history. Um, and I, I think I can speak for everyone and say we're all exhausted. You know, regardless of our partisan feelings, we're overwhelmed. Um, and, and we still have two months until elections and, I, and it's probably just gonna get louder and noisier and more complicated. Um, how, do you, how do you keep a story like this and an issue like this front of mind for people at a time when they are overwhelmed by everything. Um, and if they are um, inclined to care about the morality of something like this, probably feeling um, more unempowered politically than they've ever felt in their lives. Uh, to talk to people like you guys, honestly, I swear to you. I mean, I really, I mean that sincerely to talk to people who care enough on a Sunday morning to sit through an hour of, of listening to me or talking with me about this. Um, and he, I think the book came out on July 7th, so we're well over a month past it. And I love talking about this because I am connecting with people who care about this and have come to care about this in the way that I've learned to understand what's going on. And there's a reason that I called the book Separated Inside an American Tragedy, because it really is, it is. It's an American tragedy that belongs to all of us and we all have to own it. And it's being done in all of our names. Um, and so that's what keeps me going um, when people even at my own network would rather talk about other stuff. You know, It's been two years since this happened. And I'm really worried that putting the book out was gonna just be a big failure and, and people would have moved on. But it's been really inspiring to me that, um, that like you all showed up here this morning. I never know, I'm always kind of like, is anybody gonna show up to this stuff, you know? And here you guys are. And so that for me is the mission, to just keep connecting with groups like this, doesn't matter what size they are or how big the audience is, I'm gonna be on Colbert in a couple of weeks. I mean, I will take any opportunity that I can to talk about this because the more people that it touches, the more people it brings back to that summer two summers ago, where I'm sure some of you were out in the streets protesting, you know, what was going on. And we just have to be reminded of that. We have a question from uh, Sissy, who I'm hoping is going to allow me to unmute her so she can ask the question herself. Sure. Are you there, Sissy? Hi, thank you so much. I, I signed up for this session. Um, you know, when there are a lot of other sessions, I knew this was going to be a painful thing to listen to, and I'm really happy um, or glad that I did. Is there anything Thanks. we can do now? I mean, are there, these kids are still separated from their parents. What can we do now? I mean, I have a three-year-old in the other room. I can't imagine her being put somewhere and having to fend for herself, you know? Like, uh, yes. 
what can we do? Um, start with the groups like the ones on the flyer that I shared yesterday on my social media. Um, the Women's Refugee Commission, Justice in Motion, and KIND, Kids in Need of Defense, are part of this larger conglomerate of NGOs that are on the ground searching for um, the families that are still separated. And if you're particularly care about connecting in some way with them, those are great organizations. I just did the E-Gala for KIND, um, you know, since this is weird COVID times, and I hope to be there in person, but we did something like this, where they're raising money to provide legal defense to make sure no child that shows up in this country um, does so without legal representation, because that's where this gets really dangerous. You're seeing now, I'm sure you guys have seen the stories, but people, young children put into hotels and kicked out before anybody can even do anything about it. And so groups like them, the Texas Civil Rights Project, um, really surface that story in particular. Um, just get to know these NGOs that are on the ground uh, providing legal assistance. In LA, where I'm from, Immigrant Defenders Law Center is a really good one. Florence Project in Southern Arizona um, is a really good one dealing with folks there. Catholic Charities actually um, is probably the foremost humanitarian organization in the Rio Grande Valley, providing aid to the children and doing a spectacular job. Um, and all of it is, uh, sort of secular services, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um, but but they're, all, they're all there in different capacities to lend a hand. So there are, thanks for the question, Sissy. There are a lot of really good organizations. I'm gonna unmute uh, Steve and Laura Olson, who have a question. Sure. Hello, thank you so much. I do appreciate your reporting that you do thanks. on MSNBC. Um, I have a question and my 103 year old mom has a question. Her awesome. question is, what did they expect to do with these separated children? What they expected them, what they expect, what they say they expected was that they would hold them for a couple things. One is they would hold them, in the best case scenario, I suppose, they would hold them for a period of time that ranged from days to four to six weeks and ultimately reunite them using the separation as a punishment to deterrent to scare other people from coming. I think the worst case scenario, which actually happened to over 400 families, is that they deported the parents without the children um, and allowed the children or forced the children, I guess, to be um, adopted is not the right word, but picked up, sponsored, brought into either extended family already living in the United States or go to a, another type of sponsor who would be deemed qualified by the U.S. government. Jacob, in your, in, in your writing, you write the story. Um, oh, hey, David, I think that we want, uh, Laura has one more. You want to go, Laura, real quick? Oh, let's give Laura a second question. How about that? Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, what is going to happen to these children in terms of the future? Are they going to hate us so much that we're actually growing little terrorists and it's our fault? Oh, wow. Um, I've only seen, I'm, what I can tell you is Juan and Jose in particular are able to articulate that they know that this traumatized them psychologically. Um, and they said as much to me when I was down in Yuma covering the president's visit, maybe a month and a half ago, they asked me if I saw him, could I ask him, why'd you separate us and uh, tra traumatize us psychologically? Um, but, what I'll also say is I've not seen anything but appreciation and love and gratitude to the American people, like many of you who have reached out to support them. And so I don't know. I mean, the idea that this would radicalize somebody against the U.S. government, I actually never thought of that before. But from my own personal and anecdotal perspective, we're talking about people who came here to seek refuge who were looking for a helping hand, had something tremendously horrible happen to them, but then were approached, surrounded by, um, enveloped with the love of, of way more people than the, than the people who did to them um, what they did. And so I certainly hope not. I mean, I haven't seen the evidence of that. Um, and, and I've actually seen evidence to the contrary, which is shocking, I guess you could say, given what happened to them. One of the things you write about um, before you really get into the heart of the separation policy um, is you, you went down to Tijuana and, and were 
there um, with a kid, and then his father, I think, was Jorge. Um, and the story of American citizen children who are, are, are essentially themselves stuck um, on the other side of the border or going to school in, uh, in Baja California. Can you tell a little yeah. bit about that? Well, I do think that, and it's an important thing to point out, that um, while previous administrations never had a systematic policy of family separation at the border, especially as a deterrent, the Obama administration deported more kids than any administration in history, parents as well, and had a different type of family separation where there were parents who were deported who might have lived here for much of their lives, and the American-born children then had to be faced with a decision about, and the story that you're talking about is leave and go to a country you never knew or experienced in your life uh, in order to go to school and live with your family. And that's, that's exactly what has played out thousands and thousands of times. So I met these father and son, yeah, uh, George and George Jr., I call them. And uh, they, the son followed the father from Bakersfield because he was deported to go live in Mexico. And that's, a, that is, that's an American citizen, a future whatever, doctor, lawyer, teacher, however you want to say it, who packed up and left his life behind because um, the government kicked his father out. And, uh, and that's, that's still playing out today. I mean, nothing about that ever changed. That continued from one administration to the next. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because it'll continue into the next administration, whoever it is. And it's something that we all should, you know, again, know that it's going on and know that it's happening um, irrespective of who the president is. Do you, do you have reason for optimism on this issue? Yeah, I do for multiple reasons. And not on a, I'm, not, I'm not here to advocate policy either, right? Like, but I am here to advocate a greater understanding of why this thing that made everybody so upset happened. Watching the Democratic presidential debates, hearing the way that they talked about this issue, um, seeing that Kamala Harris is on the ticket, again, and I'm not talking about this from a political point of view or a strategy point of view, just the conversation itself is far different than it's ever been before. The idea that in a mainstream debate for president, they're talking about the abolition of the Department of Homeland Security or ICE, not, again, not suggesting that should happen, but just saying that that's part of the way that this is being talked about, rather than talked about as illegal versus uh, legal immigration, um, presenting this almost as a black and white issue. It's just not the reality of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of immigration. And so I do think it, on a purely level of consciousness, sort of, um, way in which to judge, it, judge this, I do think things are changing. Uh, I think it's gonna require a lot more work. Um, and I think, I guess, if there is an next administration, it'll be a real test of that. Because as I pointed out multiple times, the reason we got to where we are is because some of the people that were in the previous administration too. Jacob, this has been a fascinating conversation and we're so grateful to have had you and your time and, and, and your, your perspective on this. I, we've got like two minutes left and uh, I wanna just give you the floor to, to say any last things you wanna say or any last tidbits of information we should walk away with. Yeah, I think that I wrote, in particular, I covered this story as an unlikely eyewitness to one of the most shameful chapters in modern American history. And I wrote the book because, and I just really wanna stress this, there was so much that I didn't understand about what happened and how we got to this point. Um, and I still have so much left to learn. And if there's anything that I hope to leave everybody with is that my story is one story from one dude who's one journalist on one channel. Um, and there are 5,400 plus versions of this story, many of them very similar, but all of them very different. And you can only understand this by going beyond me. And it's been, you know, it's cool that we all get to hang and have this conversation and talk about this. But I hope that I'm the beginning of your learning experience around this, not the end of it. Um, and again, I just think, you know, it's important for me to emphasize, this is not something I deserve credit for. I'm just doing all that I know how to do. And perhaps some of that is my upbringing as young Jewish Jacob from Pacific Palisades, California. Um, to to share what, what I know, because I think that that's my duty as a reporter and also as a human being. So that's it. And thank you guys.
Jacob, thank you so much for your time today. Everyone, if you have not already, you can uh, purchase Jacob's book. It's, I, I think it's a New York Times bestseller now, so there's a new version. I should probably buy a second one. Um, <laughs> congratulations on that. Uh, but Jacob, yourself the 20 so something dollars. Yeah, thank you, David. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for educating us, and thank you for the work you're doing. Everyone, um, thank you for enjoying Lee Moody Festival today. We've got one more block of sessions uh, after a 10-minute break, and you can, of course, get to the link uh, from inside the schedule. I'll enjoy the rest of the program today. Thanks, thank David, and thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it.